with our fascination with conspiracy theories in this country? Uh, trying to get simple solutions to complicated situations when none seems to be available. I think it's, uh, it's an easy way out, and so people look at conspiracies. The Sirhan case, the Oswald case, the O.J. Simpson case, which the defense is playing that card clearly. They're playing the conspiracy card. And I think it's, to all intents and purposes, it's hurting the country. And what we have to do is examine these, these cases and try to stick to the evidence and not to our gut feelings about that something broader has to be involved. I'm Jess Marlowe. Welcome to the Channel 4 News Conference. Today our guest is the author of The Killing of Robert F. Kennedy. He is investigative reporter Dan Mulday. You go, went into this, though, believing that there was a conspiracy, didn't you? Not only went into it, but I, I stayed in it. My, uh, my evidence that I came up with really kept this case alive for a long time. I believe that there had been two guns fired at the scene. I believe that the security guard who was standing in back of Kennedy with a gun in his hand and powder burns on his face had been responsible for uh, the murder itself. And I spent a considerable amount of time with this security guard, hundreds of hours. Finally, I polygraphed him. Um, I interviewed uh, over 100 LAPD and other law enforcement officials who were at the crime scene and were part of the investigation. And then finally, I went to Sirhan himself and interviewed him for about 16 hours, I guess. And after all of that, I. I came to the conclusion that I that I came to. But in reading your book, it was even tough for you to let go of the notion. Oh wow! It was uh, eight years. It was like eight years of this, and um, and uh, but again, I if I hadn't gone through the gauntlet of examining the evidence and doing the interviews with the security guard, with Sirhan, with the police, um, this book probably would have had a very different ending, and I would have been wrong. Uh, this way, I did go through that gauntlet of, of complex investigation and interviewing, etc. And as a result, I've come up with a conclusion which I'm very, very comfortable with. It's, it's a little difficult, I would think, for, for you as, as a writer to have written this very compelling book, which reads very much like a, a, a detective a murder mystery, and uh, then to have to reveal the, uh, the surprise ending. No, no, I, no I'm, I'll tell you, up, I, I, I tell the readers up front, uh, Sear Hand did it. And he did alone. And what I'm saying is that basically this is like a Columbo yeah. movie where the reader knows in advance who did it and the adventure is not in the destination but in the trip to get there. And how you get there. Yeah. But Sirhan did it and he did it alone. And I'm, I'm being um, unbridled in my, uh, in my ability to discuss that. And it's, it's a very detailed trip uh, you take us on also. Yeah. Uh, you cite six questions that were in your mind that, that allowed the conspiracy theory to exist. Which of those six was the most compelling? Uh, well, it was sort of like a domino. It was sort of the answer to one led to the answer to others. I believe that the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, although they had got the right man, they had gotten him for some of the wrong reasons. Uh, the evidence is clear that the LAPD destroyed material evidence in this case. They misrepresented key facts in the case. They obstructed independent attempts to review the critical issues in the case. And as a consequence, you know, we had a situation where there were some very serious issues uh, lingering on this case. It looked like a simple solution was not going to be available to us, that there were uh, other factors to be considered, that possibly there was a second gunman. Um, so essentially what I'm saying is that the police certainly uh, solved that murder, but in fact, because I have shown where the police have gone wrong in their investigation, I in fact have solved this case. Um, it was, it was in, in your judgment, uh, though, just uh, accidental or, or bumbling police work, not, not deliberate, not conspiratorial? Well, I think that a lot of the criticism, no, no, I, I think that the LAPD's uh, mistakes were mistakes of omission rather than commission. I think that they were, I think that they, there was haste because they had a guy in, 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 a, in a crime scene with 77 people who were at the crime scene. And he was captured immediately after the shooting. There were eyewitnesses galore. There were 12 eyewitnesses. All there, was an, there wasn't a single eyewitness who actually saw uh, either Kennedy get shot or Sirhan's get, gun get close enough to Kennedy in order to match the muzzle distance tests, which the LAPD conducted, and Tom Noguchi's uh, autopsy report, both of which indicated that Kennedy had been hit literally at contact shooting. Kennedy had been hit three times. The fatal shot hitting just about a, 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 an inch away from the, the rim of the right ear. Five other people were shot that night. All of them survived. Kennedy died 
uh, the following day at 1.44 a.m. On, uh, on Thursday, June 6. So what we had was a messy crime scene, but we had a well-observed uh, crime scene. And so the police came into the matter and what they had, they thought, was an open and shut case. And there were complications to the case, and the problem became one of, as you pointed out before we went on the program, the problem was the LAPD's lack of full disclosure in this case. They concealed information, they sealed their files, and it wasn't until I had written an article in uh, Regardi's magazine in uh, June 1987 that, uh, and, and, and received support from two unlikely sources, the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post, both of whom have always supported the one gun uh, solution to this case. Both of them gave, gave me a lot of support for this, for this story. The city of Los Angeles then releases its files to the state archives in Sacramento, and there we had a portion of full disclosure, although much of the material in fact, had been destroyed. Why was the why was the uh, file kept closed for those uh, 20 years? Was it to to protect against a disclosure of police error? Well, I, I think the police knew they they had messed up in this case. I think they knew that there were errors, and I think that they were trying to figure out why. They couldn't figure out why the errors existed. For instance, there were four holes in the walls and door frames in Sirhan's line of fire, which had been identified by the FBI in an official crime scene report and its accompanying photographs. Uh, as being bullet holes, not alleged bullet holes, reported, hole, uh, re uh, reported bullet holes, but actual bullet holes. Uh, Sirhan had an eight-shot uh, Ivor Johnson revolver, 22 revolver. Now, I'm not a ballistics expert or a firearms identification expert. I don't really know a land from a groove, but I do know this. An eight-shot revolver can't fire more than eight bullets. And we, here we have the Federal Bureau of Investigation identifying four bullet holes in Sirhan's line of fire. And then I started, when I got the list of the LAPD officers and law enforcement people who were at the crime scene and doing their investigative work, I started calling them and I asked them two basic questions. Uh, what did you see that night and what did you do? And many of them were corroborating this FBI report saying, I saw these circled holes, these circled bullet holes in the walls and the door frames and Sirhan's line of fire. We're going to talk a little more about that, but we'll take a break and be right back. We're talking with Dan Moday, and the book is The Killing of uh, Robert F. Kennedy, and we were talking about the, uh, the eight-shot revolver uh, Sirhan had and uh, the reports of nine bullet holes? Or well, four bullets, bullet holes, which would account for four more than Sirhan's uh, gun. The rest of those were recovered from the victim. Or one that went through Kennedy's chest, okay. from his back to his chest, and then was lost in the ceiling space. All eight bullets had been accounted for. Your, your ultimate explanation uh, for those holes in the, in the door panel is that they were not all bullet holes. Well, what, what I found was that all, everyone was identifying bullet holes as being these circled holes in the center divider and in the left door frame. And so I started to wonder, gee, who circled these holes? Which criminalist circled these holes? I'd like to go talk to him. And I had talked to most of the people in the crime lab at the LAPD, uh, and all of them said we, they didn't know who circled the holes. So I, f I got a magnifying glass, and I saw 723 LASO and some scribbling along the top of the... Uh, uh, in each hole, in each circle. So I had a, I had a source over at the L Los Angeles Sheriff's Office and I said, find out who had badge 723 on uh, June 4th, 1968. Put me on hold, gave me the name. So I started, and his name was W2, Walter right. Two, And it became easy to decipher the scribbling uh, in the circles. 
So I tried to find two. He had died earlier, so I did an investigation on him. It turns out he was a motorcycle cop, a decent guy, an honest cop, but not a criminalist, not a forensics expert, not a firearms identification expert, not a ballistics expert. This was a guy who thought he saw evidence, and he marked his evidence. Uh, unfortunately, everyone who went past these holes in the aftermath, including these professional FBI agents, saw circled holes, saw them identified by somebody, and assumed they were bullet holes. As a consequence, for t the past 27 years, people have thought they saw extra bullets at the crime scene. In fact, these were not bullets, these were just holes. None of the... No bullet holes in the, in, other than in people. And in, there were three, there were three uh, holes in the ceiling. There were, there were two entrance holes in the ceiling and one exit. One, loss, one bullet was actually lost in the ceiling space, in the drop ceiling in the kitchen pantry at the Ambassador Hotel. There wasn't a single bullet hole in the pantry, even though both the FBI and the LA, LAPD uh, identified them. Essentially, it was the FBI and the LAPD that made the case for the second gun. It wasn't conspiracy. The, the people. second gun was really a, a compelling uh, force for those who believed in, in a conspiracy having taken the life of Robert F. Kennedy. And the most, most obvious uh, thought, and it's the one that you, I think, pursued more, because you'd done mob reporting over the years, was that it was an organized crime hit on, uh, on Bobby Kennedy. Right. I had done a book in 1978 uh, called The Hoffa Wars. It was about the rise and fall of Jimmy Hoffa. And in the book, I had had one chapter of this 20-chapter book, and I had made the case for the first time that Jimmy Hoffa, the president of the Teamsters Union, uh, Carlos Marcello, the boss of the New Orleans Mafia, and Santo Traficani, the boss of the Tampa Mafia, uh, had arranged and executed the murder of President Kennedy. Uh, the following year, the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations came to the same conclusion in their final report, saying that Hoffa, Marcello, and Traficani had motive, means, and opportunity. And then in 1992, uh, Frank Regano, who was the attorney for Hoffa, Marcello, and Traficani, stepped forward and said that he had carried the contract from Hoffa to Marcello and Traficani, who he believes actually did carry out the murder of John Kennedy in 1963. So I came in this from a background of being the first to demonstrate the possibility of the mafia being involved in the murder of President Kennedy. And then with Bob Kennedy being hit, the question became, for me, did the mafia have Bob Kennedy hit too? But in, e in either case, it would, they would certainly picked unlikely uh, shooters. What? Uh, I, I don't know very much. I, I, have to say, I have to beg off on the John Kennedy case. I just knew about the mob connections to right. Oswald and Ruby. I've never really studied that very messy crime scene well, How did scene you get a mob Dallas. connection with Sirhan Sirhan? Was it through his racetrack connections? Racetrack connections, yeah. yeah there was a guy who he was, was working as an tangentially boy, associated yeah. to New Jersey underworld named Frank Donamura. That yeah. was his alias. Uh, there were a number of very suspicious activities that were going on. I thought, when I interviewed Gene Caesar, the security guard, with the guy with the gun in his hands and powder burns on his face standing back at Kennedy, I really thought I was going to make history that day. I well, he was the obvious. Uh, he was the only other person in, the, in that uh, kitchen uh, with, a, with a weapon. Worked for George Wallace, as you yeah. pointed out. Yeah. He hated Kennedy. Yeah. Was predicting race wars and things like that. Well, and you, you put him to a polygraph test. I had interviewed him for hundreds of hours, and I'm sitting there at the end of the last interview just looking sullen, and his attorney looks at me and he says, Dan, what can we do? And I said, geez, I, I can't figure out whether this guy's innocent or guilty. I said, I don't think you went in intentionally and killed Bobby Kennedy, but I'm just wondering if that gun of yours went off accidentally. I said, what can we do? I said, are you willing to be hypnotized or polygraphed? And he says, sure. And so I went to a friend of mine, a federal prosecutor here in Los Angeles, and I said, uh, what do you think I should do? And he says, well, don't hypnotize him because that would be tantamount to tampering with a witness. Right. Polygraph him. And here's a good polygraph operator. His name's Edward Gelb. He's here in Los Angeles. He's the best. He's the former head of the American Polygraph Association. And Caesar passed with flying colors. Passed with flying colors. The only question he had a problem with was a control question. Uh, there, was, uh, there were the home run questions interspersed. And then one of the control questions is, have you ever hurt anybody? And he <laughs> answered no. And the needle jumps off the page. Well, I mean, who could answer the question, have you ever heard anybody know, without the needle jumping off the page? The guy who has the ultimate answer to all this is Sir Han Sir Han, and you spent time with him right. in, his, in prison interviewing right. him. Right. Uh, you went in there sort of as a friend of Sir Han's, did you not? Yeah, I did. I, w I went in there as a person seeking the truth. And, um, you had his brother with you? Right. His yeah. brother was, w was with me uh, and we, and for all three interviews. And uh, Adele Sirhan is one of the finest people I've ever met. Uh, Sirhan himself, a very kind, gentle person who I found... Just one bad I found trade. it very difficult to believe that this is the guy who committed this particular murder. Uh, 
And the first two interviews I had with him were kind of softball interviews. I was just trying to get as much background information as I could. I guess the first one lasted for about six to eight hours. The second lasted about four or five, six hours. And then the last one, as Adele and I were driving up to Corcoran State Prison, where Sirhan is being held, I said to Adele, I'm really going to get in his face today. And it was on uh, June 5, 1994, about a year ago. And I said to Adele, I'm going to get in his face today and see how he reacts to it. And I did. I really, really got on him. And Sirhan became another person during that interview. And we were sitting, uh, at, he was sitting like here, at a, we were sitting at a round table. Adele's sitting here, I'm sitting here, Sirhan's sitting here. And Sirhan became another person, uh, I felt. And, and, and I kept on wondering why Sirhan, who claims that he had never remembered the shooting, he was drunk that night, he claims, he doesn't remember seeing Kennedy, doesn't remember shooting Kennedy, and he's, he's just said, uh, he's just surrendered, okay, I did it, but I don't remember doing anything. Uh, that's what I wanted to find out. Did he really remember anything? And so um, I found that every time Sirhan had a memory lapse, getting his gun, writing in his notebooks, going into the kitchen pantry, pulling out his gun, shooting his gun, uh, every time he has a memory lapse, it goes to motive, means, and opportunity. And it came to a point where I, uh, Sirhan had said, ex he exclaimed at one point during the interview, this is so damn painful, I want to expunge all of this from my mind. And it was like I was hit by a straight right hand at that point. I said to myself, this guy is lying to me. Because every time he has this memory lapse, it goes to motive, means, and opportunity. Then I came up with this, this letter that uh, Sirhan had written to his attorney, the Hey Punk letter, which I, which I uh, had the transcript Cooper, of, yeah. to Grant Cooper, his defense attorney, essentially talking about splattering the brains of both Cooper and, and Bob Kaiser, who had written a very excellent book on Sirhan back in 1971 called RFK must, Kai, the, uh, must Die, a quote taken yeah. from Sirhan's, uh, Sirhan's notebooks. And to me, this is not a guy who doesn't remember what was going on. Also, Michael McCowan, an investigator for Sirhan, and his defense team uh, indicated that Sirhan had, had, was, he was having a conversation with Sirhan who had maintained he doesn't remember anything. Suddenly, here's Sirhan telling his own investigator, Michael McCowan, about looking into Kennedy's eyes just before he shot him. And McCowan is startled by what he's just said and what he's just admitted. He says, then tell me, Sirhan, why don't you shoot him between the eyes? And Sirhan replies, because that son of a bitch turned his head at the last second. This is a guy who remembers what he did and lives with it every single day. We'll be uh, back. We'll take a short break, and then we'll talk a bit about motive, means, and opportunity right after this. You still having fun? You still have fun? Yeah.
Subtitle of your book is An Investigation of Motive, Means, and Opportunity, uh, and you've used that phrase a good bit. No question that uh, Sirhan had the means, he had the weapon, uh, the opportunity, something else. You conclude that he had stalked Kennedy. Right, yeah, it's, the evidence is clear that he had stalked Kennedy I, on, on no fewer than three prior occasions, and possibly on a fourth as well the previous Sunday. But how did he happen to know that Kennedy would be using that pantry to get from one place to another in the That's ambassador? That's the big question that the FBI has always had and the LAPD has always had. I think it be, could be explained by simple luck. He was moving around the hotel. It seemed logical that he wasn't going to go off the front of the stage go out into this massive crowd in the embassy room uh, and then go to the colonial room uh, through, the, through the doors, through this, this huge crowd. The logic was that he would go out the backstage area through this kitchen pantry into the colonial room, which was adjacent to the crime scene. So that gave Sirhan the opportunity to... Well, right, again, he was moving around, he just caught him at the right time. He had to get close because he had a, 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 essentially a cap gun. He had a 22 revolver, which wasn't going to have a lot of power unless he got real close. Uh, again, you know, there were two people, two of the five uh, people were shot right in the head, yeah. Yeah. and both of them survived no problem. But Kennedy was hit, like, literally at point-blank range, almost at contact range, and he didn't have a chance from the headshot. It was the headshot that killed him. He would have survived the other two wounds, but it was the headshot that killed him. Leaves us to the key question, and that is the question of motive, and, and Sir Han has suggested some of that. He has suggested many things, and now, uh, during his parole hearing last December, uh, he's now starting to say, I didn't do it. I wasn't responsible. I may have been programmed to kill, programmed to forget. Um, Sirhan is now seeing that being the good guy and saying, okay, I did it, even though I don't remember doing it, is not getting him out of jail. And right now, Sirhan is prepared to say anything and do anything to get out of prison. At one point, he, uh, he, he said he did it for his Arab brethren. But that was after he saw the, uh, the reaction by a lot of people coming to his aid, uh, a lot of people who he viewed as Arab brethren coming to his aid and, and, uh, and helping him out. Helping but the Arab out. leadership, including the, the militant Muslim leadership, rejected that Absolutely. and rejected him. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely correct. But there were those within the Arab community, more fundamentalist, more, uh, I mean, let's face it, Sirhan was a Christian. He yeah. was not an Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalist. Uh, I believe Sirhan did it just basically to get famous. I really do. He had told Bob Kaiser in Bob's interviews with him, he said, I am, I, they can gas me, but I am famous. It took me a minute to do what it took Kennedy his entire life to do, and that was get famous. Well, he was a classic loser prior to this, was he not? I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was a guy who was losing at the racetrack, couldn't hold a job. His, his dream was to become a jockey. Uh, his training as a jockey showed that he had no nerve. Uh, he, there were women who he liked but could not get. Uh, and to all intents and purposes, Sirhan had, perhaps unfairly, uh, misjudged himself as a failure at age 24. And I think the way that he could prove to himself that he had nerve, the way he could prove to himself that he was a person was to make himself bigger than life. And I think somehow he managed to do that when he went into the kitchen pantry on June we 5th all and shot Bob Kennedy. We all assumed after Sirhan was arrested that uh, as a Palestinian it was probably, the motive probably was uh, Robert F. Kennedy's uh, support for Israel. Right. But Sirhan was unaware of the fact that Bob Kennedy had supported sending phantom jets to, to uh, Israel. He was unaware of that fact until he was told about it in prison by a, 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 a person from the Arab Anti-Defamation League who showed him a New York Times article in which, which, which dealt with this. Suddenly, after Sirhan saw this New York Times article, suddenly this became the reason for his, his motive, his, his feelings, his changed feelings towards Kennedy. This guy changed with the weather. I think that he needed some way to look at his, his sainted mother in the eye, a, a very fine person, an innocent victim in all of this. He needed some way to look her in the eye, and he couldn't give her the motive as being, I wanted to get famous, Ma. I think it became something more political. It became something of a higher order for him, and I think that was the bottom line, the reason why he did it. Uh, his mistake in all of this was talking to me. That was a big mistake on his part. Other people who talked to me, like Gene Caesar, like the police, uh, that was a good thing, and, and that helped resolve a lot of the lingering questions in this case. Will your book mean that he will probably never be released on... Uh, Wherever he is, he should only stay there. 
and um, and I'm hoping that uh, that Sirhan is not released. He'll go back to the parole board in '96, uh, try to seek his freedom again. He is prepared to say or do anything. His attorney, a very fine lawyer here in town named uh, Lawrence Teeter, uh, will be trying to get a new trial on the case. And frankly, if Sirhan has Johnny Cochran and, and Robert Shapiro as his attorneys, I guarantee you he has a good chance of getting off. And the LAPD the will be back on trial again. The LAPD, of course, will be on, on trial again, and, and uh, if Sirhan had gotten off after the first trial, he would have been out blowing up the World Trade Center or something like that. This is a very, very dangerous person, and he should remain in jail. All right, thank you very much. Dan thank Molde, you. the killing of Robert F. Kennedy. I'm sorry that's all the time we have for our broadcast today. Again, our thanks to Dan. I'm Jess Marlowe. Thank you for being with us. is the killer tree, the tree that was...